Hey, it's Ed at Recruit Me, and for this week's Great Grantham News, I'm going to go via satellite link to have a chat to a local businessman, Tony Ruby, who is the Grantham Estate Agent, brought to you via EXP. I'm going to ask him a few questions. So we'll start with, just who is Tony Ruby? So who is Tony Ruby? Um, so Tony's 47-year-old uh, family man with three children, lives in Grantham, uh, born in Grantham Hospital. Uh, worked in Grantham since the age of 16, went to college in Grantham at the age of 16, worked at various places like Morrison's, uh, Curry's Electrical Store when it went up onto London Road in the current Marks and Spencer's uh, unit, um, before that on the High Street in the current Sabres unit. Um, worked in property now for 17 years, um, not just in Grantham but in various other locations across Lincolnshire including spells in Lincoln and Boston and Spalding and a time in rental during the last housing market crash which was around 2008, 9, 10 sort of time. Um, made redundant from that particular employer, it was my first employer in the industry. Had two years with a corporate and then more predominantly nine years with a large, what was a large um, family owned business and then was brought out to become a corporate entity. And um, that's a little bit about me really. Uh, children, I have three, a stepson called Kian who's nearly 16, a little girl, I say little girl, she's not anymore, she's nearly 11 in November, and a little boy who's just turned five. So after taking the plunge into self-employment, were you ever scared or worried? It's a great question. It's one I get asked quite frequently. Um, in my mind, I'm getting to an age now, I started looking at this particular way of doing things probably late in 2019. But before that, I'd had a, a, you know, an itch to run my own business. Um, I think there comes a point in life where if you don't do it now, you're going to regret not having a go. And I could very much live with the regret of failing. I just couldn't live with the regret of not having a go. So um, I'd spoken to my wife and, and good friends. A lot of my friends have got their own businesses. I'd spoken to them about you know their experiences of working for themselves. Not one of them had anything bad to say really about it, whether they'd go back to being employed, they'd you know, all answer categorically no. And I just felt there was not a better way of doing things, just a more personal way of doing things. You know, I was always challenged with going out and getting 30 listings a month, which is great. But I was then passing them into the hands of six, seven, eight, nine other people who didn't know these people, hadn't met them, hadn't been to their home, didn't understand what they were trying to do. So it felt a bit detached, I suppose. Uh, I'd still speak to my clients after the point of instruction because I felt that was my responsibility to do so. But what I did also find was there was an awful lot of people who, I don't know, like I said, they felt a little bit detached. And, and, and there was an attrition rate, you know, <clears throat> we were targeted to list a certain number and that number was 30, but the gross net listings, sorry, the net listings for the month was to be 20. So that's, you know, 10 that go out the back door. And that was kind of the business model. In my mind, I was like, well, if you could just look after everybody in a better way, it takes more time, yes, and it takes more effort, yes. But that's where you have to then juggle the reverse of not wanting to deal in volume, but deal in quality. And I thought if I could do that, you then start to build a business which is very much based upon recommendation and people being confident in you, happy with you, to put your name into conversations and allow this self-fulfilling thing to start developing and building its own head of steam. And so far, touch wood, um, there's been um, definitely that sort of response. Was I scared to start off with? <clears throat> I'm not an arrogant person at all, but the short answer is no. Because what I faced up to is what the potential worst scenario could be. And the worst scenario would be, I had a go at this and it didn't work. So what's the worst that happens? I have to go back and get another job. Okay, well, you know, that, that doesn't sound like the end of the world to me. Um, so I kind of came into it with that mindset of, you know, if I work hard, be relentless, determined, have a vision and try to stick to that vision about what I wanted the business to look like, then I didn't think I had anything, anything particularly to be fearful of or scared of. Um, but I also knew that the worst case scenario would be that if I went on my own and things didn't work out, the worst case is I'd have to go and try and get a job on the high street uh, with another agent. So what was it like getting your first listing or sale on your new venture with EXP? Well, um, very emotional. 
uh, very um, just humbled, um, surprised, shocked. I don't know which words to really that sort of best fit it, but um, I was on a, a gardening leave period. Not gardening, I had three weeks of holiday to take. So my previous employer had a three week notice period, three month notice period. <clears throat> I worked for ten weeks of that, doing what I was doing, and. The last three weeks was holiday that was due to me, so I took the holiday. Um, and in that period of time, I put myself to work. I couldn't obviously advertise what I was doing. I couldn't tell people what I was doing. Um, but word had started to get round, and not, not through me sowing seeds. And, and I had two listings ready to go. So in that three weeks, I did a few things um, with getting those listings ready. So I suppose I had sort of three weeks of preparing these listings and doing the videos and getting everything ready, but couldn't do anything about them. But the clients were aware of that. They knew that I had a certain date. I finished my employment contract at 6 p.m. on the 17th of June, 2021. And by half past six, both those listings were live. I went out, got in the car, uh, went to both the listings, did a Facebook Live. <clears throat> and I remember walking around the corner to the first one and just welling up. Uh, on this Facebook Live, it was it was amazing feeling to see my board outside, the clients being really happy as well. You know, sending me pictures of the board on the day it's gone up. You know, it was like wow, just amazing. Um, and I think you know those two first two listings happened to be my first two sales as well. The market at the time was very very hot, so when we went live with those properties, we got a good numbers of viewings. We created viewing days uh, over a couple of days, and within a week or so, both those new listings had gone under offer. And we had other new listings then coming into the pipeline as well. Um, but I still get the same buzz and love out of seeing a board outside of a property that somebody's trusted in us to do a job for them. It's, you know, it's a major milestone in life, moving house. We don't do it very often. So to be asked to do it for people who have either lived in a property for a year or two or 25, 30, 40 years, it's, really, it's a really proud moment for me, without a doubt. So Tony, we've seen you go above and beyond for a lot of your clients all of the time and your social media channels display this, the awards you've won show recognition for this. What actually drives you to do this for your clients? Self-pride, I think for me, uh, I've always worked as hard as I can in employed roles. I've always wanted to make myself indispensable. Um, I suppose being made redundant back in 2010 kind of gave me that edge really. Everything works out for the best usually, you know, that redundancy day, <clears throat> again back in 2010 was a day that I'll never forget. I was driving home very angry and upset and annoyed. Um, you know, four weeks beforehand, I'd been told my job was always safe for that company. And I just remember the, the devastating feeling inside late November, nobody recruits in December. And because I've been there for only a certain number of years, you only got a certain amount of, of payoff. You know, it's enough probably to get me through to the point of needing to have a, a job really come January the 1st. And I managed to secure something in that period of time. But I think it's things like that that kind of keep you right on it. Um, I'm very proud to say that after nearly two years, we've not lost a single listing to another agent. Um, I think that demonstrates that we are <clears throat> hardworking, determined and committed to our clients that do entrust in us. Because as I say, it's quite commonplace for people to have a listing with one agent and then move it somewhere else. Um, I dare say that day will come one day, uh, but to be two years in and not have had that yet. We've had withdrawals, but they've basically stayed put. They've not moved home. They've not gone to another agent. They've basically been sacked. So for me, that, that is a, I'm really, really proud of that. I'm really proud of what we put in. We stick to a process. We believe in the process. Um, I think the clients believe in the process and uh, they feel like they're an important part of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and without opportunities, there's no business. So the harder I can keep on doing that, the better I can keep on doing that. Hopefully the more opportunities start to come on the back of it as well. We've seen you do some exceptional property tour videos. How has this helped in building your brand? The brutal honesty is, I think it's, the, the, it's the, one of the main reasons what has built our business and brand. Um, these were done post COVID. I've, I've done video in, in marketing property now for, uh, I would guess six or seven years. The first one was terrible. It was windy. You couldn't hear what I was saying. I was chasing the vendor around the house, basically sort of telling him I was going to do this new thing that I thought might work, but it allowed me to market on social media and really allowed me to market property on social media to a different audience than Right Move and Zoopla would see, but also to an audience of potential sellers. 
Um, and, and that for me was kind of like the double-edged sword of going into video marketing for the properties. Over time they've evolved, um, I don't know, probably done 2,000 of them now in total I would think. Um, Post-Covid I realised that we needed to be able to get people to see property but without putting themselves at risk. So therefore the virtual tour is more like a viewing. It's three, four minutes long, depends on the size of the home, <clears throat> but it allows people to perhaps look out the bedroom window. It allows people to sort of stand in two corners of the room. I'm not saying it replaces a viewing, far from it, but I think what it allows people to do is get an idea of what that home is all about, more so than what video and floor, sorry, pictures and floor plans can deliver. I don't expect anybody to make an offer on the back of it, but again, if you've got somebody who's looking to come to the area on a Saturday and they've got enough time to view six houses, you want to make sure that those six they're looking at are definitely in the running for them and the video tour allows them to either yes categorically say that could well be one for me or say actually no it's not for me and they don't obviously then it's more time efficient um, it doesn't inconvenience our clients as often we might only need six or seven viewings now to make a sale whereas perhaps you might have needed 12 or 14 before uh, so yeah it's got a lot of benefits other than just building brand and or uh, creating a larger audience Tony, we've seen a lot of people mimic your property blogs, your vlogs, where you're talking about the tours that you're doing of your clients' properties that are on the market. And I think what I would put it down is imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. How does that make you feel? And do you like others copying your marketing ideas for your properties? I don't, I don't know if I am the pioneer of these things. Um, again, when I first started doing them six or seven years ago, for me, it was about being the agent that did it first. I didn't want to be the agent that was following, not copying, but you know, doing something that somebody else had already broken into. And I think it takes a certain amount of effort and uh, commitment, and there will be days where you don't want to do it, and you think, I can't be bothered with this today, but you have to. You know, it's, it's part of your package you're offering your clients. Um, it's probably the reason you're there in the first place. So it's very rare we get a client saying they don't want one, um, it does happen, but it's very, very rare. Um, I would say that other agents should be encouraged to utilise video. The world is a very much on-demand place today. Um, you know, we can order videos to watch now on Amazon or Netflix, whereas before we had to go to Blockbuster. We can order food to come to our door. We can order groceries to come to our door. We can order pretty much anything to be at our door tomorrow through Amazon. And I think the world is evolving and, and, and this industry has to evolve with it as well as it get left behind a little bit. So in my mind, it was always about making sure that we had something that was keeping up with that on-demand trend. You know, my videos work 24 hours a day and quite frankly, I can't. So when I'm asleep, people are working night shifts or whatever they're doing, they can browse, they can see more about a property. And, and that is a very, very useful facet. I think, you know, any agent that doesn't want to embrace that is probably missing a trick. So what do you think are the biggest challenges facing the property industry and estate agents today? And how actually do you stay ahead of the competition? I think most agents' biggest challenges are their own mindset and thinking. Um, the market is constantly changing. Um, yes, we have great times that often get very publicised by the, by the media. And the market has hard times where the, the media obviously talk a lot about negative press. But actually, I think the agents need to just look at their position in the move process and what they're there to do. They're there to make sure a prospective client is looked after. They're there to make sure that a prospective client feels like they've got somebody they can trust and believe in. Um, if they've got any questions, somebody they can lean on, somebody who can help them determine an onward purchase and whether it's a good, good buy for them. Even going on viewings with you know, to another agent's stock with, a, with their client, I think will make them feel particularly well looked after. So in my mind, I think the, the agency industry as a whole has to sort of look at itself and and sort of just reevaluate what exactly it is they're there to do. I think unfortunately it's become too transactional. It's become too impersonal. It's become too much of a numbers game um, because of volumes. And I think that leads back to you know, agents probably in this country, overall, not just in Grantham, just not charging enough. Um, you know, in other countries around the world, it's not uncommon to see fees between four and six percent, and or, or uncommon to see a seller and an agent, uh, sorry, a seller agent and a buyer agent working together, uh, and then splitting commissions. I think there's a lot to be learned from the bigger, wider world of um, property and, and real estate, if you like, 
uh, from other areas of the, the world uh, that I think we're missing out on. The problem with low fees is it means you've got to do volume. And if you've got to do volume, you don't have the time. And if you don't have the time, you can't build relationships that are worth anything. So let's face it, a, a trust relationship takes time to build. Are buyers still attracted to the Grantham area, Tony? Are buyers still attracted to the Grantham area? I would say now more than ever. There's always been a bit of a myth that Grantham was always a hotbed for commuters. And to a degree, they are probably quite right. But I know of commuters who have bought in other places, you know, Sleaford and not too far away. And the numbers of commuters at one point was analysed how many people were catching the train from King, um, Platform 1 at Grantham in the morning to King's Cross. But of course, the world's changed. And we still see people who need to commute. We still see people who have got to be in the office one day a week or a couple of days a week or a couple of times a month. But it's probably not as much as it used to be. So for those who are coming into the area, I think Grantham's a massive beacon for prospective buyers, particularly families. You know, you sort of only have to look at the transport links we've touched on there with the rail, but the road links. Then you throw into that things like KGGS and King's School, Priory Ruskin, outstanding rated Ofsted School and a phenomenal selection of primary schools within the villages and the, the greater town itself. And I think for a family, we demonstrate good value great positioning, we're easy access to Peterborough, Nottingham, Lincoln, Leicester. You know, there's lots of places within easy striking distance of here. And I, and I think we are very good value for money. You only have to go half an hour south to Stamford, beautiful as it is, but it's mightily expensive. Go a little bit further south, it's even more expensive. So I think a lot of people now look at Grantham as a very, very viable um, place to bring their family up. Um, I think it was the Daily Telegraph in the last couple of years have announced Grantham as one of the top 10 best value commuter towns. And I would very much agree with that. So last one from us, Tony, and it's probably a bit more personal. You're a family man, you're a businessman. How do you strike that right work-life balance? <clears throat> My biggest challenge in the last two years has been finding a balance. I've always worked hard. Uh, I think one of the reasons I came away from employment was because I recognised when my little boy was born five years ago that how much I'd missed out on my little girl's first four or five years of life because I was in the office till eight, nine o'clock, working um, two, three, four nights a week. Um, and it got to the point where I thought this has got to change with Archie. So when Archie came along, I did uh, secure another position um, and in the end didn't go, but I was given back a lot of my Saturdays, so we used to work every other Saturday, so 26 Saturdays a year, I was giving those back. Um, and it allowed me a little bit more of a balance, but even then I was still working Saturdays and Sundays when I was employed. So the biggest challenge I've found so far as, an, as, a, as a businessman, if you like, or as a, as a separate entity now, you know, standing on your own two feet, has been, has been finding that. And I think the main reason for me has been more a case of Again, the reasons I mentioned before, working hard and being relentless, <clears throat> recognising that every step I take is, is helping another client and a buyer in some way, um, and also helping the family, of course. But the one thing I've got to make the biggest address to is how I get that life work-life balance right. Um, we, I work closely with my wife, who's very much part of the company. She has been now since uh, Christmas 21. Uh, we have an assistant who joined with us on the 1st of March, that's helped no end. Having the right person who you trust and believe in, who also believes in what you're trying to achieve, isn't easy to find. Um, but we have found them. We've known them for a good 10, 12 years. <clears throat> and they offer something very different to us, but they're also excellent at what, they, what we want them to do and what we need them to do. So I think that's the first step towards finding that proper life balance. However, saying all that, you know, my little boy's got a assembly next week and it's at 9.30 and I'll be able to go. You know, I'll make sure the diary works around that. My little girl often has dance shows. I'll make sure the diary's set up so I can go and see those things. Some of the things that I perhaps wouldn't have been able to do if I was reporting to other people within. So there is definitely a work-life balance there. I just need to make it probably a little bit more in the favour of life rather than work. Tony, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, from behalf of all of us here at Recruit Me and Devon behind the camera who's organised it, been really great to try something different for Great Grantham News and we really appreciate the time you, you've given us. If people have liked this, do give us a follow on LinkedIn where these articles come out every Wednesday and get in touch with me at ed at recruitmeuk.com if you'd like to be featured in this article in future episodes. Thank you very much.